Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm Thomas V. Miras. This podcast is an offering to the Holy Family and, less importantly, a production of CatholicCulture.org. Hello there, everyone. As Thanksgiving approaches, I've got some interviews in the pipeline, but to tide you over for Thanksgiving week, I thought I'd put together another uh, episode of Highlights from the podcast archive of good clips from episodes in the past that you may or may not have heard, uh, depending on how long you've been listening to the show. And uh, for the first one, I'd like to play a clip from one of my most popular episodes ever. I think this is number six. If I if I were ranking the most popular episodes by download, this would be the sixth most popular one. This was an interview with Mary Stanford, a professor at Christendom College, uh, on her interpretation of Ephesians 5 using Pope St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body. So the topic of the episode was uh, authority and submission as gift in marriage. And I've cut out the 15 minutes or so that are are really the core of the episode, um, the, the best part in my opinion, although I really would recommend listening to the whole thing at some point, and I'll link to it in the show notes for you. And in this she talks about, uh, to sum up this section, uh, authority as gift, submission as receptivity, and also how obedience and friendship can coexist in uh, a marriage, because some people think those two things are incompatible, but that that is a misunderstanding of both authority and friendship. Right. And again, you know, you look at the word authority, you see the word author there, you, it's connected to the idea of a source, okay? An author brings a thing to life. It gives it life. And Again, you know, God is really the only true author in the ultimate sense of the word. But again, when you think about how did Christ give life to the church, he did it by actually giving his own life. And so that authority is ultimately rooted in gift. And this is a difficult concept because when we hear the word authority today, the modern mind thinks power, might, manipulation, control. Again, this misunderstanding of authority goes right back to the Garden of Eden. That is the suggestion that the devil makes to Eve, okay, that God's relationship to them is not one of God is gracious giver, and they as these grateful receivers of their very lives, their being, and everything around them. No, he says, no. No, no, no. God knows if you eat that apple, you will have the knowledge to be like God's. He's just holding back. God is just trying to control and manipulate and keep power from you. Okay, so right from the beginning, the devil suggested that no, no, no. Knowledge is power. As soon as you eat that apple, you'll have the knowledge to be like God. Knowledge is power. When that that is a suggestion um, that Adam and Eve you know, they, they buy into, but nonetheless, there's no support for it. Okay. God had given them nothing but beauty and blessings and love and goodness in the garden. So they had no reason to believe that this gift was anything other than a gift. Okay. God expresses himself. He expresses his power by giving. And so right from the beginning, humanity misunderstands gifts. We don't understand gifts very well today in our culture. We really don't understand what it means to actually be thankful for something. And, you know, we're a culture of, of gift cards and what do I want for my birthday <laughs> and, and feeling obligated when someone gives us something and wanting to discharge the debt and, you know, give something back so you don't owe them. You know, we don't understand gift. But if you go back to the very beginning, we see there was a misunderstanding that was proposed by the devil that authority is something bad, something manipulative and controlling, when really the true meaning of authority is gift-giving, life-fostering love. And that, that's what the heart is called to do. If the meaning of authority is tied up with giving gifts, um, then that tells us something about in what sense the wife must submit to her husband. And you make this very profound point in uh, your article, which really struck me, which is that you do not receive a gift on your terms. Yeah. 
it, when you look at the sort of structure of a gift, I, I talk about this with my students a lot. I draw a little diagram. You know, there's a giver. Every successful gift <laughs> has a giver and a receiver. And the giver in offering that gift is truly vulnerable. They're vulnerable because their gift could be rejected or abused, mistreated. And yet on the other end of the gift, the receiver is vulnerable and has to trust that this gift is truly just that. It's not an attempt to control, to manipulate, to trap me, right? It is in fact an expression of the other's love. And in receiving it, it's a really an immense, it's a privilege, but it's it's daunting because the way in which a gift receive, is received has a direct effect on the giver, okay? You have the capacity in receiving a gift to receive it as it is given, as it is offered, you know, no demands, no expectations, and to receive it with the word we call gratitude, right? That's rooted in the word gratis, which means free. You are freely receiving, you're choosing to accept it as a whole. If you put demands on it, it's not really a gift, it's an order. Right? It's something you've ordered or something that if it's something that's owed to you, it's certainly that's justice or business or commerce or something. It's not the same thing as a gift. And so the receiver of a gift really plays a tremendous role in how the giver is going to feel <laughs> based upon this response. And if you abuse the gift, the giver is wounded. If you only take what you want from the gift and sort of toss the rest, I always use the example with my kids of if my husband proposed to me and I took his engagement ring and I said, wow, this is a beautiful ring, but that diamond is really tiny and shabby. Let's perhaps take it back to the jeweler. Maybe we can get a bigger one. And so I say, well, you know, I, I accepted part of the gift. You know, no, no, <laughs> he's not going to feel good when I do that. So that a gift is not ordered. It's not, it's not really requested. And when it's received, it has to be received as a whole and in the way that it's offered. If any of those things is missing, um, the gift is, is not a gift or the gift is spoiled and the giver is wounded. So there's a tremendous responsibility that, that falls on the receiver. They have a tremendous power in that way. Obviously, both the husband and the wife are giving themselves to each other, but maybe we could say that you know, as St. Francis says, it's in giving that we receive. There's a sense in which for the wife, it's in receiving that she gives. Absolutely. And, and I, you know, I talk about this too, that when I think in the course of my own marriage, I've certainly performed many good deeds uh, for my husband. A lot, of, a lot of cooking, a lot of cleaning, a lot of children raising, a lot of getting up in the middle of the night. And he treasures and values all of those things. But I can tell you with certainty that the greatest gift that I've given to my husband is responding in a loving, grateful, appreciative manner to everything that he does for me. That's what builds him up. That's what mm -hmm. keeps him happy and trying, it keeps him happy and continually trying to make me happy. So it's amazing the way I know I do a lot. He knows I do a lot, but I know that I could be doing all of those things, getting up with kids, you know, working a part-time job, whatever it is. There's a lot of things that, that wives do, but if they're not receiving their husband's gifts well, he's not going to feel appreciated, respected. There's going to be unhappiness in that marriage, and none of that other stuff is going to matter to him. So definitely experience that. So we've gotten to one aspect of the word submission, but I suspect that this may not be the part that people have the most trouble with, at least in theory. And they may have plenty of trouble with it in practice, and, no, and doubtless they do. But we have to talk about this issue of obedience. And you mentioned this problem that we have with authority in modern times. And I'm thinking about how, well, in preparing for this discussion, I was reading some different things people had written on this topic. And I came across one writer online who clearly was of the school of thought that, you know, John Paul II got rid of uh, male authority over the wife and uh, replaced it with mutual submission. And we don't have to worry about that anymore. And she kept repeating over and over again that, that in a loving relationship of 
companionship between peers, there is just no place for exercising authority or for obeying. That to her, that just completely would destroy the love, create resentment, et cetera, et cetera. She couldn't see the two as compatible whatsoever. And you know, this is a really problematic idea because it stems from a broader attitude that we have towards authority. And if we're going to have that attitude towards our husband then or any authority over a, us, we're going to have that towards Christ because it is a, a paradoxical thing, but Christ is both our Lord and our friend, and we are both his servants or even his slaves and his friends. And, uh, and it's... I can't say that I understand that, that I understand the first thing about how that works and how that, how can I possibly live with Christ as both my God and my friend? I, that's, that's a, it's a total mystery to me. And, uh, you know, I trust that, you know, I'll be illuminated in time, but, you know, it, it's like the first principle of, you know, relationship with Christ. So if if it's not possible in a marriage, then it's not possible with Christ. But I think I guess the thing is that it's only possible in a marriage because Christ has made it possible in relation with himself. Yes. And I think that's where that that line about mutual subjection in Christ is so important because it is qualifying. And even in you know, I've got lots to say about what John Paul says in the theology of the body, but even in Mulieris Dignitatem, he says that all of the reasons in favor of the subjection of the wife to the husband must be understood in the sense of a mutual subjection of both out of reverence for Christ. If they are not informed by the grace of Christ and they're not motivated by that relationship with Christ to live out this dynamic, it's not going to, it's not going to function properly. So, from the beginning, yes. But as I point out in my article, and as I can say now after having been married for 19 years, that what I call final say decisions, the things that the thing that makes everybody so scared about this topic, like, is he making all the decisions and I'm obeying him? You know, the fact is, no man wants to make all the decisions. Believe me, they don't. Okay. So these Final say decisions where you just can't reach a consensus, they're rare, okay? They're rare, but they're big ones, right? They come up every couple of years. <laughs> and, and what I've come to learn is a couple of things. Number one, that he doesn't really want the responsibility any more than I do. But, <laughs> but as Edith Stein says, <laughs> the husband is not Christ, okay? But he's called to be the image of Christ in this relationship. So number one, he knows he's not perfect. And he knows he might make the wrong decision, okay? And yet, in these matters, okay, she says a woman has a unique capacity. She says that women, because of our personal orientation and because of our desire for relationships, that very often we are willing to sort of get enthusiastic about things that are far from anything that would have interested us otherwise for the sake of the relationship. I like to use the example of my football knowledge. I was not very interested in football, but when I was dating my husband, I noticed he was, and I got to hang around with him more if I would come over on a Sunday afternoon and, and watch some football with him. And in that process, I'm not going to lie, I, I came to appreciate it more, and, and I really do. I like it a lot more than I did. But I'm not sure if he would have been able to do the same thing with me over, say, romantic comedies or I don't know some of my other interests, because men are very much object oriented. They're focused on the thing itself. It's harder for them to get on board with the decision that they truly don't see the logic for, the reason for. Women do have a capacity to get on board with something that they may not totally agree with. I'm not talking about something that's morally wrong, but something, you know, an option for the family that they don't totally agree with for the sake of the relationship. It, it does tend in general to be a gift that we have to get on board with something. What's more important is that in making that final say decision, he is going to be more willing to take responsibility for it, particularly if it fails. Because let's face it, things fail. Guys are not perfect. Husbands are not perfect. They're not omniscient, right? They can't predict the future. Things go sideways sometimes. But if they go sideways and it was his call, he's going to be on board to make it right. And I think deep down, what it really shows 
obedience, we also misunderstand obedience in our culture, but obedience is not really, we like to talk about it being a blind thing. Obedience isn't blind. Why does my child obey me? Sometimes I'll give explanations to my kids for why I want them to do something, but other times they're not ready to understand it or I'm in a hurry. And I'll look at them and I'll say, do you think that I love you? And they'll say, yes. Well, do you think that I would make a decision that isn't good for you? And they always say, no, mom. Do you trust me? And they'll say yes. So ultimately, going with the will of another <laughs> is an expression of your trust. And for me to say, husband, all right, I trust you in this. It is absolutely a part of that gift dynamic. Because when I laid out that gift dynamic before about the giving and the receiving, both sides are having to trust, okay? But when someone trusts in you, okay, particularly as a man, when someone says, I trust you, I believe in you, that is going to build them up and ideally give them the strength to go forward and claim responsibility. So again, these situations don't usually happen very often in a marriage. And this seems to be the aspect of obedience that we get so riled up about. But an act of obedience is ultimately an act of trust, which is absolutely an expression of love for the other. And building that unity, that unity that a family so desperately needs, and that building up the man so that he can claim responsibility, especially when things go sideways, is essential in building that family unit. So that was a clip from episode 48 with Mary Stanford. Next, I'm going to play you a little bit of episode 45. This is one of my rare solo episodes, meaning I didn't have a guest. It was just me talking. And uh, I was talking about uh, libertarianism and, and problems with libertarianism from a Catholic perspective. And the bulk of the episode was spent summarizing a wonderful uh, academic article by Edward Fezzer uh, critiquing the libertarian conception of property rights from a natural law, a classical natural law uh, perspective. But the opening section of the episode, which uh, this also uh, was one of my most popular episodes that I've done. Before discussing Fezzer's article, I talked a bit about my background as a former libertarian and some of the reasons that I had uh, rejected libertarianism ultimately. So I'm going to play you a bit of that section. Again, I recommend listening to the whole episode uh, to get a good summary of uh, Fezzer's argument, especially because that article of his is unfortunately uh, behind an academic paywall. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to summarize it in the episode. That and I couldn't get him as a guest because he was too busy. I have a mind that is very much geared towards thinking of things in abstract principles, and it was the clarity of libertarianism as a philosophy where you could look at any policy issue and determine the right answer by means of a philosophical principle. That very much appeals to my cast of mind, and I, of course, now see that as one of the dangers of ideologies, that they, in fact, allow abstract principles to run wild with a sort of seductive simplicity and seeming clarity to them. One of the arguments that uh, some of the libertarian thinkers I read would make on particular issues would be that you know, these are rational principles by which we can determine these things. But if you don't draw a hard line somewhere, then your decisions will be based on nothing but arbitrary whim. So the height of my interest in libertarianism would have been, I guess, probably 2012, 2013. And in particular, I believe it was in 2012 that I attended uh, what is called Mises University, which is a week-long summer program in economics and libertarian political philosophy, which is hosted by the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, which is named after the Austrian economist and philosopher Ludwig von Mises. Now, there are a lot of people with different views that call themselves libertarian, so I think it's important that before I criticize libertarianism, I explain the particular type of libertarianism that I was involved with at this time, because there's libertarians who just want to be able to smoke pot legally. There's libertarians who are not philosophically principled in a consistent way, but are sort of libertarian in their policy views because of their uh, study of economics or for other practical reasons. 
And certainly anybody who calls themselves a libertarian will regard economics as a very, very important aspect of libertarian thought, even though they would usually make a distinction between their theory of economics and their libertarian political philosophy. The libertarian thinkers I was influenced by at this time were very much into what is called the Austrian School of Economics. Now, I think the Austrian School has made some very, very valuable contributions to economic thought, and I actually interviewed an Austrian economist, Jörg Guido Hussmann, on an earlier episode of the Catholic Culture Podcast, so I'll link to that on the show notes page at catholicculture.org slash episode 45. But fundamentally, the kind of libertarianism I would have considered myself a part of is based primarily on philosophical principle rather than on economics. And I would say they were more consistent in bringing libertarian philosophical principles to their natural conclusion than most libertarians are, uh, to the point that many of them were anarchists, or as they called themselves, anarcho-capitalists, to distinguish themselves from various other weirdos who consider themselves anarchists, like anarcho-syndicalists and anarchist-communists and whatnot. So the quintessential anarcho-capitalist would be Murray Rothbard, who was the founder of modern libertarianism and one of, one of the founders of the Mises Institute, uh, and also kind of the successor to Ludwig von Mises in the Austrian tradition of economics. And libertarianism in the Rothbardian tradition would be based on the idea of self-ownership, that we own ourselves absolutely, and it is from self-ownership that all our other rights flow. And that means that all rights that human beings have are essentially in the form of property rights. And from this comes uh, what libertarians call the non-aggression principle, or the NAP, which simply states that you cannot, for any reason, uh, initiate aggression against another person, which would mean that any kind of coercive state apparatus or taxation or anything like that would be completely morally indefensible, no matter what practical reasons might be given for it. And that's why I say that this school of libertarianism is based fundamentally on philosophical principle and only secondarily on economics. In fact, uh, the economics is often put to use by those thinkers as a way of trying to prove that no form of political coercion would actually be necessary for society to function. Now, as a side note before I forget, uh, I mentioned that a lot of libertarians, mainstream libertarians out there, just want to be able to you know, smoke pot and visit prostitutes without being hassled by the popos. The libertarians I was paying attention to were definitely not that. A lot of them tended to be socially conservative, and in fact, I noticed that quite a number of them were Catholic, which appealed to me at the time, despite the fact that for some reason they tended to be traditionalist Catholics, which I am not. So definitely the most popular Catholic, uh, libertarian, anarcho-capitalist thinker would be Tom Woods, who was a big influence on me for quite a while. So people who are libertarian in their political principles, but conservative in their social uh, views and their moral views as far as personal behavior is concerned would often be referred to as paleo-libertarians, Ron Paul being sort of the most high-profile example of that, although he's obviously not an anarchist himself since he was running for president. Now, another thing about this school of libertarianism that appealed to me as a Catholic was that many of the thinkers... Uh, including non-Catholics, would try to ground their libertarian principles in what they called the natural law. In fact, Murray Rothbard took an interest in natural law. He talked about Thomas Aquinas, and he considered himself to be an Aristotelian in many ways, whether he was one or not. I've come to conclude that Rothbard didn't really understand the natural law very well, but at the time, it was very novel for me to see a non-Catholic thinker paying respect, at least on the surface level, to someone like St. Thomas Aquinas. So, at this time, I never actually became an anarchist myself, but I flirted with anarcho-capitalism for maybe a couple weeks. Um, the problem is I was never convinced by the idea of absolute self-ownership as a Catholic. I didn't think that we do absolutely own ourselves. Although there was a simplicity 
to it, which I found appealing, namely the idea that basically if I as an individual don't have the right to tax you or to take your goods and use it for my own purposes, then neither can I confer that right upon the state to do so in my behalf, which would mean that when somebody becomes a state official, they don't magically gain the right to steal where other people cannot, or to kill in waging war where your average citizen is not allowed to do that. And this is actually a very understandable conclusion for a libertarian to come to, given that we are all told in the society that we live in that government derives its authority from the consent of the governed. And from a Catholic standpoint and a natural law standpoint, this is simply not true, at least in such a simplistic sense. But if it did gain its authority solely from the consent of the government, then it would indeed be hard to see how I could authorize the government to do that which I myself have no right to do to my neighbor. Now, the nature of the state and its authority is a topic for another episode, but I'm just trying to give a sense of where I'm coming from in my present opposition to libertarianism. So... The reason I did not become an anarcho-capitalist and the reason that I ultimately rejected libertarianism, um, you know, in not too long a time after I realized I couldn't be an anarcho-capitalist, which I conceived as the purest form of libertarianism, is that I just did not think that it was ultimately compatible with Catholic social teaching. It is a clear teaching of the church, for example, that governments have the right to tax people. And if they have the right to tax people, then taxation cannot be intrinsically immoral. Taxation cannot be theft, contrary to the libertarian slogan. If, as St. Paul says, governments derive their authority from God, then government cannot be an illegitimate institution. And also, despite the fact that the simplicity in principle of libertarianism appealed to me to a degree... I ultimately found it suspicious. It just did not seem like you could really build an entire political philosophy on property rights. And as a Catholic, the idea that all rights are property rights just seemed weirdly monomaniacal and and ideological in nature. Just in general, this is not typically the way that Catholics think about reality in this monomaniacal way. So despite the fact that I learned much from libertarian thinkers that I continue to find valuable, that I find their economic arguments uh, compelling much of the time and their practical arguments against a large intrusive state compelling, I ultimately decided that I could not be a Catholic and a libertarian. And this was not because I had found perfect arguments to refute libertarian arguments. I was taking it on being an obedient and faithful Catholic, and I figured I would find the arguments later. So again, that was a bit of episode 45. I think the title was uh, Libertarianism versus Natural Law on Property Rights, and uh, you can find the link to the full episode in the show notes. Uh, next, second to last, I'm going to play you some clips from episode 47. Uh, which was about the brown scapular. And, and I uh, had a wonderful uh, Carmelite priest, Father Justin Sinante, on just to talk and summarize the, the spirituality of the scapular and some, some deep aspects of it that people might not be aware of. That I, even I, you know, I wasn't aware of. I've been wearing the scapular for years and years, but only learned about them relatively recently. So first, here's Father Justin giving an overview of the spirituality of the brown scapular. Like I mentioned, when I wake up in the morning, I, I put on my habit, and I'm going to be in service to the Lord and, and Our Lady as her servant, you know, in ministry. And it's a tangible sign to me that I'm clothing myself in her virtues and, and ultimately bringing her presence. That's what the Carmites are with the Marian Order of the Church. We bring her presence uh, to our ministries, uh, you know, in a very real way. We see Mary so close to us as our sister, even in the spiritual life. And she's journeying with us to heaven, ultimately, and bringing us to heaven. So that's a tangible sign that we wear. Um, so in the morning, when I get dressed and put on my habit, I kiss the scapular as a sign of uh, reverence uh, for the sacred garment that I'm wearing. The habit as a sign of, of my consecration to God as a religious of, of Mount Carmel, and also as a reminder to other people of, of my consecration to God. You know, um, So that's a, a beautiful habit for all those who wear the scapular, uh, to kiss the scapular in the morning. And there is an indulgence that is associated with kissing the scapular that the church gives. 
And also basically as well, it's a reminder, as I mentioned, to the individual soul to be in uh, union with Jesus and Mary throughout the day and to bring their presence uh, into the world ultimately. That's that's the goal of every Christian is to bring Jesus' presence into the world. Uh, so the beautiful habit of praying the, the morning offering, basically we're, we're offering our joys, our sorrows, our works. We're giving everything to Jesus through Mary, basically our whole day. And by kissing the scapula, by placing it over our our heads as we pray that morning offering, we're giving, doing, making a tangible act to show that we're, with God's help and God's grace, we're going to be his, his hands and his feet in this world. A great Carmelite Saint Teresa of Avila had that beautiful prayer about Christ has no body now, but yours, no hands, no feet, but yours, yours are the hands which he blesses this world. So this tangible uh, sign of putting on Christ and asking, we're offering our joys, our sorrows, we're giving our whole day as a gift to God offering to God. So there are some basic requirements of how you live your life that allow you to sort of receive the graces of this this scapular. So so what would those be? Yeah, so the traditionally the, the three uh, practices is to wear the scapular or the scapular medal. So Pope St. Pius the 10th gave permission uh, especially in, in very uh, hot climate if it's difficult for them to wear the cloth scapular now the cloth scapula is preferred because it's it's actually it's a real sign of, of a mini version of the habit that the Carmites wear. But in any case, if a person can't wear a cloth scapula after they've been enrolled in the cloth scapula, they could replace that with the scapular medal, which is on one side is the image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and on the other side is the image of Our Lady among Carmel, and that would have the same privilege as say the, just wearing the cloth scapula. So. It's better that someone wears either one or the other, you know. But anyway, so in wearing the scapula medal or the scapula always, the second is to observe chastity according to one's state in life. Again, that's how we go to heaven is by obeying the commandments and living in God's grace, living in a state of grace. So ultimately, that's what that promise is, so to speak, that, and again, every Catholic Christian sh should live in a state of grace. If they fall out of God's grace, they should, especially if they have mortal sin, they should run to confession right away. So that's, the, that's that promise of not staying outside of God's grace, to observe chastity according to one's state in life. And if they fail in that area, like all of us, if we, anyone who fails in that area should go to confession. So to those devoted to Our Lady, I should go to, go to confession to live in a state of grace. And the other is a practice of a Marian devotion. It's either the, the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It also could be, or you don't have to do all of these things, but it's one of these things. So you could pray the little also, office of the Blessed Virgin Mary as a daily prayer, devotion to Our Lady, or the Holy Rosary. That's a, of course, that's encouraged uh, to pray that as a daily devotion to Our Lady, or some other Marian devotion or active charity that we could do on a regular basis with the permission of the priest. In this next segment from the interview, Father Justin talks about the so-called Sabatine privilege of the brown scapular, discusses the connection between Carmel and some other famous Marian apparitions, and tells some stories about the effectiveness of the scapular as a form of spiritual protection. Pope St. John Paul II, as I mentioned, had great devotion to the scapular. And there, there was a time that uh, the Sabatine privilege was not allowed to be spoken of anymore by the Carmelites. And he actually asked uh, the two generals of the order, one of the, of the ancient observants, the Oak Carms, which I belong to, and the general of the OCD friars, the Discalced Fathers. And uh, he asked them at the time uh, if they could make a comment or a statement about this Sabatine privilege. And both generals of the order at the time said, well, you know, we can't really say, you know, like, hold this to like, oh, Mary definitely said that if you're wearing the scapular and you're dying, you know, the Saturday after your death, at this time, Mary's going to take you out of purgatory. And, and, and Pope John Paul II kind of agreed and said, yeah, we really can't kind of hold her to that. But I think the balance is what you're saying is, is so true. When we live in a state of grace, when we show devotion to Mary, when uh, we pray on a regular basis, well, these are the graces that, that the church and, and our Lord and Our Lady gives to us in order to achieve salvation. And it's this idea of being consecrated to her, dedicated to her, Mary will take care of us. She will she will uh, intercede for us. And so if it's pulling us out of purgatory the Saturday after we die, or whenever, you know, the idea is that we who are devoted to her in, in our life will be taken care in our death through her intercession, uh, giving us those graces that we need throughout our lives, you know, and that's really what sacramentals are. They're holy reminders 
they don't, they don't give us sacramental grace, the sacramentals, but they do give us graces. So it's a prayer, any prayer that we offer to God, reading the scripture, Eucharistic devotion outside of mass, the rosary, the scapular, wearing a medal. Uh, these are all sacramentals that aid us and assist us in the spiritual life. They're holy reminders uh, that help us to be reminded of God's presence in our daily lives uh, as an act of, of in, uh, asking uh, for those graces that we need to keep fighting the good fight. So, and, and we know devotion to Our Lady is so powerful uh, because she is the one uh, ultimately that crushed the head of the serpent. Uh, she is the one that gave God a body. She is the one that interceded for us at the, at the first miracle, the wedding feast of Cana. Uh, she stood there at the foot of the cross. She received the Holy Spirit with the apostles of Pentecost. Um, and she intercedes for us night and day before the throne of grace. In heaven, she is our mother, she's our queen. So she she gives us all those graces that we need, you know. Uh, she intercedes for us. Uh, she helps us to get to heaven to, to be more like her, uh, her son Jesus. And I, and I think of that, you know, why do we honor so much? Ultimately, without her fiat, without her yes, the second person of Blessed Trinity would not be able to have taken flesh. And the same way salvation came into the world through Mary, so too salvation comes to an individual soul through Mary. And again, the scapular is is one of the greatest devotions uh, to show that in the rosary are the two devotions. And, and they were really reiterated at Fatima, you know, uh, praying the rosary daily and being clothed in the brown scab or the habit of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And even it's, uh, it's an interesting tidbit, almost all Marian, common, recent Marian devotions uh, go, have a connection to Our Lady of Mount Carmel because one of the oldest titles of Our Lady, a devotion to Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So even at Lourdes, the last apparition at Lourdes, was July 16th, the feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And they asked the rector at the time, you know, was there any significance of, of the feast day with the apparition of Lourdes? And she said, and he said, of course there is, you know. So this title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and there's actually a Carmelite monastery of nuns that have a monastery at Lourdes, you know, that pray for all the pilgrims that go there. So we even see Lourdes as a devotion to Mount Carmel there, a connection to Mount Carmel. We know Fatima, even Nock, where Mary appeared in Nock, that was one of the first Carmelite abbeys in that area that came from the Holy Land in the 1200s, I think it was like 1282, the Carmelites went there and built a monastery. And there's also a Carmelite monastery of nuns at Nock. So even uh, these Marian devotions, uh, the popular Marian devotions, these, these apparitions, there's always some type of connection to Carmel because Carmel is all married. You know, it's, it's a place, we, we believe every house, every Carmelite house, Carmelite monastery, Carmelite priory, it's Mary's house. We are her sons and her daughters, you know. We are in her service. Uh, we bring her presence to other people. So that's the devotion, really, of Carmel. Uh, it's so close to Our Lady's heart, you know, and she just manifests her intercession through the scapula. I mean, I could share with you many miracles, even to this day, that I've witnessed uh, healings. And, and so that's what the scapula does. I know another story of, of, a, of a young man, a, high school, a senior in high school at the time, and I enrolled him in the scapula that day at a retreat. Well, that night, he was driving home, a deer jumped in front of his car. He swerved out of the way off the road, down a ditch, car tumbled over three times, and totally, car was totally destroyed. His buddy, who was an atheist, did not go to school that day, did not go to the retreat that day because he didn't believe, but he was a vol volunteer, a fireman, and he pulled his buddy out of the car. And he said to his friend, I never saw anyone survive an accident like this. And the boy who was in the accident said, it's because Mary saved me, her scapula saved me. Well, later on, this kid was, was going to become a Marine, after he graduated. So I gave him the scapular and I said to him, you know, what's this that you're an atheist? Oh, I don't know if I believe father, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, didn't you tell me about your friend? You sort, you pulled him out of the car. You never saw anyone survive an accident like that. He said, yeah, but I'm still not sure if I believe. I said, well, just do me a favor. Wear the scapular and ask Mary to help you to give you the gift of faith. I saw the kid a year later. He came up to me. He's wearing the scapular. He started going back to confession, uh, went back to mass, and he, and he has faith in God. <laughs> well, that's because of... of of opening his heart to Our Lady, you know, and by wearing the scapular, it was a tangible sign of opening his heart to Our Lady. So those are just two miracles that I could tell you of others as well, uh, of, of Our Lady performing these miraculous things, not only saving people from explosions and car crashes, but also ultimately giving them the gift of faith. And that's really what's going to save us in the end. That's that's really beautiful. And I, I think that openness you touch on, it kind of points to the difference between that and like a presumptuous wearing of the scapular because you know the presumption would be kind of a, a hard-hearted like 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 you're using the scapular 
to enhance your kind of complacent attitude. Whereas in these cases, they may have been atheists or thought they were atheists, but it was a matter of what direction they're heading in. You know, they were heading in a positive direction by putting on the scapular and there was an even just a tiny bit of openness there that could allow the graces to work. So, and then, you know, I had another thought too, it's like, it seems like a lot of, for a believing Catholic, you know, this promise to be saved from hell at the moment of death, it seems maybe it has to do with final perseverance. In other words, like someone might think, well, I could live a good Catholic life my whole life, but, you know, there's a lot of temptations at the moment of death. And what if I taken in by the devil, you know, in my dying moments? And I think, you know, the scapular is a promise for protection, particularly at that moment. Like if you are living this scapular way of life sincerely through your whole life, I'm not going to allow you to fall at the end. Yeah, it's very true. Um, actually, St. John of the Cross, his brother was also a Carmelite. And he one time he, he was at a possessed man started shouting out to him. And he said, the three things that rob the demons from hell, the demons are robbed from, from a people, is the holy name of Jesus, the holy name of Mary, and the brown scapular. The demon yelled that out. He said, the three things that, that rob souls from us is the holy name of Jesus, the holy name of Mary, and the brown scapular. So that, that was, you know, so that you're right. And, and, and that final temptation at that last moment, you know, the evil one will, will try to his hardest, but, you know, calling upon the name of Jesus, Our Lady, um, of course, having the sacraments, uh, whole use of holy water, uh, the scapular, sacramental, yes, uh, we're protected from the evil one. In this last clip from episode 47, Father Justin talks about how anyone who's enrolled in the Brown Scapular uh, has a share in the privileges and the spirituality of the Carmelite order, uh, one aspect of which is a connection with the prophet Elijah. Because this gift was given to the Carmelite order, and later on the order and the church kind of gave the privilege to anyone who shares the spirituality of the Scapular and, and to kind of share in wearing our habit, and our devotion to Our Lady Mount Carmel, uh, there is that spiritual bond with the Carmelite order. So, yeah, that's exactly what, where I wanted to go next. So, yeah, let's let's talk about that. Sure. So basically, you know, again, as a Carmelite priest, I'm in the service of Our Lady ministerially. You know, as a priest, uh, offering sacraments uh, to people, and I'm a chaplain to a, at a school, so teach the faith to the young people there and offer them the sacraments as well and and whatnot. And and so I'm in the service of Our Lady. We could say as a Carmelite priest, right? and the service to the church. But also, the, there's a great contemplative aspect of the Carmelite order. So even though we're active friars, we're basically still hermits as well, you know. Uh, we bring that prayer, that spirituality, that quiet, that solitude that we receive in prayer uh, to our active ministry. So we're, we can say we're contemplatives in action, right? But there are contemplative aspects to our order. Or, for example, the, the, the nuns, or for example, most of the order, all the nuns are cloistered and contemplative. So they live that contemplative life on a regular basis, and even in some cases, in an enclosed life. We still have hermits as well. And we also have the lay Carmelites of the third order as well, and or also a congregation of, of sisters, active order of sisters that are Carmelites, but who maybe teach or nursing or whatnot. So this is the Carmelite family. So you have the first order, which are the friars, which are priests and brothers. You have the second order, which are contemplative nuns, and you have the third order and lay Carmelites. Uh, these are either congregations of active sisters or lay people that share in the spirituality of the Carmelite order. And basically part of that is the confraternity of the, of the brown scapular. So anyone who wears the brown scapular, like I mentioned, and being enrolled in the brown scapular, they share in the order, in the spirituality of the order. They are spiritual members of the order. So uh, they would share in the joys and the works and the sorrows, kind of like we talked about that morning offering earlier. Uh, they share in the work of the friars, spiritually speaking. They're connected to that, uniting themselves uh, with Our Lady and wearing her habit. Uh, we all do that and we're all in her service. So they share spiritually with the Carmelite order as a whole. So these are the friars, the nuns, uh, the lay Carmelites, uh, the congregation of sisters, and they share in the work and, and the prayer of, of the Carmelite order. So just by wearing the scapular, there's a spiritual, we could say, connection or fraternity up to the Carmelite order. One of the things that intrigued me is the connection to Carmel also involves a connection to the prophet Elijah. So can you tell us a bit about the connection that the Carmelite order has with Elijah? 
Yeah, so Elijah is our, our father. We see him as a, as a spiritual fo- founder of our order. Now, there is a tradition, again, again, we can't prove this historically, but there is, we do know that Elijah lived an aspect of his life as a hermit on Mount Carmel. And there were Jewish hermits that lived on Mount Carmel. There's a tradition that says the original Carmelites were Jewish hermits, that after the incarnation became Christians. So we, again, we this is more of a pious tradition, historic history, but we'd say we're the oldest order in the church. We even happened before the, the incarnation because there were Jewish hermits living on Mount Carmel. But the reason, the connection to Elijah, we could say in a modern sense is because the hermits lived on Mount Carmel, and Mount Carmel is a holy place even to this day for Jews and, and Christians and even Muslims because they kind of all venerate Elijah the prophet, right? And where we had our first kind of chapel and, and the place that we lived was by the well of Elijah, the spring of Elijah, which is still there to this day. And they mentioned all those other groups, uh, Jews and even Muslims, kind of venerate that, that place. But that's kind of where we, we have our connection. And in our rule that was written in 1208, Albert of Jerusalem was the patriarch, and uh, the brothers went to him and asked him to help formulate a rule. He was a papal legate to the Holy Land, and uh, he basically wrote in the rule, you know, to the brothers on Mount Carmel who lived by the spring of Elijah. So it's kind of where we get the Elijah kind of spirituality and tradition uh, from. Now, in the book of Kings, and I remember the story there when there was a drought in the land, and there Elijah was there, you know, on the mountain, and he sees uh, this kind of cloud that comes over the horizon, and it looked like a, it said a man's hand, and then all of a sudden uh, the rain came upon the, the land and, and, and brought much fruit. Now, the early Carmelite friars and hermits kind of saw this image of Our Lady in that, and the, there's a, the pious tradition that Elijah had an apparition or a vision in that cloud of the Immaculate Conception, and, you know, as we hear from the prophet Isaiah, you know, that the um, virgin shall be with child and they shall name Emmanuel. So this image of that, almost Elijah had this kind of prophetic vision of the Immaculate One in that cloud. So now sometimes you see an icon of Elijah the prophet and in the, cl- in the there's a cloud and, and you see Our Lady the Theotokos, Mother of God there, with the child in her womb, you know, as this image there of kind of Elijah seeing this image uh, or this knowing that the salvation will come to the world through the Virgin Mary. And then some, and that's where you say traditionally too. They would say that's why the early hermits dedicated the first chapel there on Mount Carmel, the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know, so this idea that Mary appeared on Mount Carmel to Elijah the prophet. Again, it's a pious tradition. We can't prove it historically, but I think it's a beautiful image there. The prophet, this great prophet Elijah, you know, uh, looking to the fruit of Mary's womb, who will bring life to the world. So it's like that cloud brought rain. Uh, to this drought on Mount Carmel, yeah, from Mount Carmel, so to Our Lady uh, brings life uh, to souls because of the fruit of her womb, who is Jesus. So that's kind of the, the kind of spiritual tradition of Elijah, the prophet to our order. And also this idea of being prophetic, you know, how, you know, stood, it, that phrase really is a Carmelite phrase that we, we, we have adopted from, the, from Kings, I have been zealous for the Lord God of hosts. So every Carmelite kind of sees themselves as a son of Elijah, uh, standing before the face of God in prayer, most especially. That's that's the contemplative aspect of, of the order, because Elijah was, was prophetic, but he also was contemplative. And, and again, that's what we hope to be as Carmelites. We're prophetic and, and kind of standing up for goodness and justice sake, you know, uh, witnessing to, to our faith and preaching and teaching the gospel. Uh, but also uh, we have that contemplative dimension of prayer and solitude that we find strength from in, in being able to preach that, that gospel truth and message to the world. Okay, so those were some clips from episode 47, which was titled Our Lady's Habit, Wearing and Loving the Brown Scapular. The last episode that I'll feature in today's highlights episode is number 49, A Catholic Composer in Queen Elizabeth's Court, Part 1. This was an interview with uh, musician and scholar Carrie McCarthy about the great English Catholic composer William Byrd. Uh, It was the first part of a two-episode interview with her, so I'll just be playing segments from part one here. And I'll play these segments just back to back uh, without any interruption. Uh, So you'll hear Carrie talking first about Bird's uh, context of his musical career working in church music right after the uh, Protestant Reformation in England. You'll hear her talking about the musical values of the Reformation and how they differed from Catholic uh, sacred music. 
Then you'll hear about Byrd's life as a secret Catholic uh, who was simultaneously working in Queen Elizabeth's court and his sort of double life as a composer of Catholic uh, liturgical music. And then finally, you'll hear a movement from one of Byrd's masses. One interesting thing about Byrd is that he didn't really live through the Reformation the same way that older composers did, people like Thomas Tallis, for example. He never really knew what the old world had been like. When he was born in 1540, that was the year that the last monastery in England was dissolved. The last monastery was shut down, the monks were sent away. And Tallis, by the way, had been an employee there. He, he wasn't a monk, but he was hired as the organist and a singer, and he got sent away the moment that Bird was born. So Bird never really knew this old world. He never knew England as a more or less stable Catholic country. The first 20 years of Bird's life were almost total chaos. All of these ideological lurches back and forth. We have reports at the time that the English people never knew what was coming next. <laughs> Both the Catholics and the Protestants were usually miserable because things were so unstable. And to have grown up during that era when you know, you're being trained as a boy chorister, as a young singer. And you, know, you want some kind of stability, but if they come in every six months and say, well, the church music's going to be completely different, what we believe is going to be completely different, that, that must have been very destabilizing for a young musician, a young person in general. What was the musical tradition that he would have, let's say, in another alternate timeline, you know, where there wasn't King Henry VIII, you know, was a different kind of guy than he was, and the Reformation didn't take control in England, what kind of musical tradition would Byrd have inherited? And what were the changes that were, in fact, ultimately made? Well, one thing that was true in the old tradition is that there was a lot more singing. There were many more services. In fact, there were eight a day and one at night, and a much more elaborate ceremonial. They sang through the entire Psalter every week. And there was just, there were a lot more notes to sing. And a young chorister, a boy soprano at one of the cathedrals, would have been singing for six or seven hours a day. It was basically a full-time job, even for young folks. Hmm. So what would the music have been? Obviously, they had chant, and that is something that was largely gotten rid of by the Reformation. Uh, but was there a, by the time, let's say, by the time immediately preceding the, the Reformation, would there have been any kind of tradition of polyphony already in place in Catholic music, or was that just sort of in only there in seed form at that time? Oh, absolutely. There was a lot of complex polyphonic music. There were really basically three types of music that people would have been singing in the old tradition. As you said, there was chant. There was a lot of chant, large, beautiful books with all this repertory in it. And a lot of that boys would have memorized. It would have been part of their training to learn this stuff from memory to have the psalms memorized, to have these melodies in their heads. So that, that was the first kind of music, chant. The second kind of music was improvised music that was usually based on chant. And that's a tradition that a lot of that got lost around the Reformation because people didn't need to do it anymore. Some of it still carried on in music lessons, in music theory books. But the idea there was to take this chant that everybody would have known really well, they would have had a lot of it memorized, and you can improvise on it, sometimes just simple chords, um, sometimes creating these more elaborate melodies. And that way you could, you could make music at a moment's notice. You could make long services a bit more interesting for the singers and for the people listening. And you had this skill set to be able to create new music on the spot. So that, that's the second kind. And then the third kind is what you were mentioning, polyphonic music, where you have sometimes huge, huge pieces of newly composed stuff that composers would write in four, five, six, seven parts. And we have some gorgeous manuscripts of this music. There's an especially famous one from just around the year 1500, so the generation before Bird was even born, and that's called the Eaton Choir Book. It's a large choir book, which is at a, a very fancy British public school called Eaton College. In fact, it's, it's still, uh, still there at that boarding school. And it has it's this huge book. It's, it's large enough for a whole group to sing off of, a whole choir. And it has this really gorgeous, complicated music in up to nine parts. So they had a choir that could sing in nine different parts. And they'd, um, they, they'd sing this music on special occasions. Very often, 
you'd have most of the services during the day would just be in chant or be simple improvised music. But then at the very end of the day, you'd have a special piece of music for the Virgin Mary, a special antiphon, it was called. And the idea there was to have the best music you could possibly have in honor of Our Lady, have the special piece, and then everyone goes to bed. <laughs> so as this kind of, kind of high point at the end of the day to have this mm. music. And of course, what, one thing that happened at the Reformation is you're not allowed to have devotions to Mary anymore. So that whole genre went right out. All that stuff was gone. It's a miracle we still have this book. <laughs> What were the musical values of the Reformation? Because you talk about Calvinist musical values a lot in the book, and mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't have thought that I wouldn't have thought of Calvinism as being something that was prevalent in in England at that time. So, so what was the? I understand there was some kind of tension, at least, between more of an Anglican attitude and more of a Puritan attitude in in, in sacred music as in, in many other matters. So what would have been your sort of mainstream Anglican attitude versus your Calvinist attitude towards church music? Well, as you say, there were a lot of competing views about what church music was really for, what it should sound like. As soon as you got this independent national church, you had 5,000 different views about how things should go forward. And the, um, in fact, the Church of England at the very beginning, you know, under Henry VIII, when he first made that split from Rome, was extremely conservative because, well, Henry liked it that way. He was, in, uh, in many ways, a very conservative man. He liked Latin. And he liked fancy music. Um, <laughs> and really, a, a lot didn't even change at all until after he died. And in some ways, it, it looked like things were going to go in a more Lutheran direction. You know, in some ways, very liturgically traditional, keeping a lot of Latin, keeping a lot of traditional melodies. After Henry died, things got a bit more extreme, and you, you started to get Calvinist ideas coming in. And there, there was a lot of argument back and forth. And finally, the compromise they settled on was what's known as the Book of Common Prayer. And that's, in fact, still the book, a, a newer edition of it, a newer version that they use in Anglican churches in England. And the principle there is, of course, everything's in English. The daily routine of services is cut down. So instead of all the hours of the office, you just have matins and evensong, one in the morning, one at night. And the idea was for really just musical styles to become a lot simpler, a lot more straightforward, so you could hear the words. And there, there was something fundamental that was going on there. And I, I always like to go back to this when I, when I talk about Bird, because it really helps us understand what was going on with church music. And it's one of the big ideas of the Reformation. And this, this is something that all the various wings of the Reformation, the more high church, more low church, they, they agreed on to a certain extent. This idea is that the whole purpose of worship, the whole purpose of, of church services is to teach in some ways, is to be didactic. When you, when you sing in church, when you read in church, you're teaching something. You're teaching people something. The, this idea that even when you're saying prayers to God, you're ultimately exhorting the people that are there. You're talking to them. And as soon as you have that, that shift of focus, this idea that one of the main purposes of worship is, is to teach something, or not just gratuitously being there and worshiping God because that's a good thing to do. All sorts of changes happen. All the music is in the vernacular. It's all in the local language because everyone has to understand it. The musical style is going to be a lot simpler because you have to hear the words. The music's going to be a lot shorter because every little piece has to be to the point. And one thing that happened in the Reformation is music got a lot shorter and the sermons got a lot longer. So you have two hour sermons, but two minute pieces of music. And that the focus is very much on the word in general and music as a vehicle for the word. Maybe it would be good now to talk about his life as a recusant. And uh, that, that means someone who essentially if refuses to attend the Anglican services at their mm -hmm. local parish that, they're, that they live within the bounds of. So it seems as though at a certain point, Bird was pretty much like generally known to be a Catholic. Mm -hmm. But – it seems as though he was protected to a certain degree by being in the queen's favor. Is, is that basically how you understand uh, his sort of ability to do, go through this thing uh, relatively unscathed? He definitely had friends in the highest places. He got away with a lot of things that somebody less well-placed wouldn't have gotten away with. And at a certain point in his life, 
he also did have to make some hard decisions. He wound up around the age of 50, moving away from the court and not being there in daily attendance anymore, um, essentially collecting his fee in absentia, <laughs> which uh, is kind of a bit of a trick there. He kept collecting his, his salary from the court, but he moved out to the country. He moved out to Essex, so about 20 or 25 miles away from central London, where he could live among Catholic families who were celebrating the sacraments clandestinely in secret, and turned his energy more to that. And you could tell right before that was going on, there was some tension happening in his life. He, as you say, he was starting to get called out for this. People were noticing that he wasn't attending his local church. The, um, one of the job perks as a gentleman of the Chapel Royal is you got a lot of time off. In fact, in, in some ways, the whole Chapel Royal was double cast. You had twice as many singers and organists as you actually needed. And for much of the year, you'd alternate a month on and a month off. So people got to go back to their homes and uh, not have to serve the queen every day. And people started to notice that Bird was not going to his local church. And as you mentioned, by the end of the 1580s, that had become a serious civil offense. It wasn't just a problem with the church courts. Or, I see Mr. So-and-so hasn't been coming to services, so we're going to fine him two pence, you know, or <laughs> some sort of some token amount. It was a real criminal offense because the, the political friction was growing. This, uh, this idea that, well, the Catholics really want to bring in the Spanish army, and <laughs> this is right about when the Armada was happening, and take over the country by force and assassinate the queen. And this idea of them not just being dissenters, but this sort of violent menace, that was happening. And we even have evidence that Byrd was put under a kind of house arrest for a while, that he was told, don't leave your house, don't go visit your friends, don't even go sing for the queen. At, at one point, he was actually named as being a former servant of the queen, sometime servant of the queen. I think he saw, he saw things tightening down on him. And around the age of 50, he just, he just broke and said, I, I can't go on living this double life. I'm going to go move to a different part of the country and start focusing somewhere else, put a slightly different focus in my music. And that's when you start to get his masses his three famous masses, he seems to have been just about the first thing he wrote in that new situation. And it's such a different style. You, you can tell, in some ways, a weight has really lifted from him. You look at some of the stuff he wrote when he was slightly younger, it has this kind of anguished quality. And then with the masses, just the, the window opens, the light comes on, and there's this kind of simplicity and freedom to it. It's really striking. But even before that move to the countryside, and before he started publishing Catholic music, he had been putting some, for lack of a better term, even though I don't particularly like this term, but some sort of Catholic dog whistles in his, <laughs> in his texts, hadn't he? Absolutely. A lot of his music had, uh, for example, stuff about the city of Jerusalem being destroyed, being besieged, being desolate. All these images from the Lamentations of Jeremiah, talking about this destruction of the holy city, all this stuff from the Old Testament prophets about dreadful things happening to the kingdom of God, all of this stuff would have been picked up on by Catholics as being a metaphor for what was going on for them. Of course, there's also the fact that Byrd wrote a lot of very dark and melancholy music. That was something that was fashionable anyway. If you think about Elizabethan poetry, there's all kinds of tragedy and heartbreak and depression. Even Elizabethan art, the colors very often tend to be dark and this kind of claustrophobic little canvases. So that's, melancholy is something that was fashionable. But with a lot of these pieces by Byrd, as you say, there are these little hints in the text that Catholics would have picked up on. And it's, it's pretty obvious he meant this as a message. This was something he was working out in his own music, in his own mind. Wasn't there something you mentioned in the book having to do with funeral music? I can't, I can't, I just, all I wrote down in my notes here was mm. funeral music, but wasn't there some Catholic connection there? Yes, a lot of the pieces he wrote during this, this last stage while he was still at court, they were going back to the old tradition of English funeral music before the Reformation. That is, back when it was still allowed and encouraged to pray for the dead. 
you had these very elaborate funeral services that, again, Bird would never have sung as a young child because right around the time he was old enough to sing, all this stuff was thrown out the window. But he set these old texts with prayers for the dead. Some of those pieces of music, he even set the old chant melodies. He'd take one of the four or five or six parts, and he'd give that part the chant to sing in long notes, and he'd build the entire music around it. So it was very much a tribute. In some ways, <laughs> subconsciously, it might have been a sort of funeral for the old tradition. Here he is almost mourning the loss of this thing. Um, but that, that's something that's very striking in that period of music. And if anything, that would have been politically more problematic than just setting gloomy stuff from the lamentations about you know, what, what a sad situation we're in. Um, prayer for the dead was illegal. Mm. Any, anything having to do with purgatory, very, very clear teaching in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer that um, where the funeral service says we're not here to pray for the dead. Nothing we do can affect their situation. You know, we're here to thank God for them and to console the living. So that, that, in a way, would have been much more politically dangerous than any of this melancholy, emotional stuff. At a certain point, what's fascinating is that Bird just starts openly publishing Catholic liturgical music. I mean, how is this even possible? He's very, very careful about how he brands it. For example, the first Catholic liturgical music he publishes, he actually puts through the printing press and makes thousands of copies of, are his masses, his three masses. I think you're going to play an excerpt from one or two of those on the show. Yeah. But the nice thing about those is you can tell how careful Bird is being. He doesn't dedicate them to anyone. He doesn't write a little letter at the beginning. He doesn't say who the publisher is because the publisher could get in trouble. He does put his name on them because he, he always wants credit. It says Bird at the top of each page. And the most important thing is he doesn't actually call them masses. The word mass. Wow never appears on any of those pages. In fact, he never gave his masses names at all. They're, they're really the only Renaissance masses I can think of that don't have names. I suppose hmm. there are a few that, that have been published as a missa sine nomine, or usually because they're based on some scurrilous secular song with, with filthy words that the composer doesn't want you to know about. But right. with birds' masses, they don't have titles, they don't have names, and the word mass, which would have been a complete political disaster for him even to have said in public, is nowhere in those books. And when you start to see his masses listed in people's collections of music, when people would sometimes make a catalog of the music they had in their house, or if a bookseller, for example, had a list of everything they had in their shop, what they were almost always called were curies. Of course, the first word of the mass is curie, Lord have mercy and they were called birds curies. So there seems to have been this sort of open secret hmm. that, well, we won't call them masses, we'll just call them by their first name, the first word. <laughs> but he, he knew how to keep safe. And then he realized, okay, I've gotten away with that, and now I can publish some more elaborate stuff. And here now is Bird's On You Stay from his Mass for Five Voices, as performed by the Gesualdo Six.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed those clips. And again, if you want, you can check out the full episodes uh, from which they came uh, via the links in the show notes. And if you've stayed here this long, uh, let me just remind you that Catholic Culture is in our uh, fall fundraising campaign, which will determine if we can continue working uh, through the next year, not only the Catholic Culture podcast, but the website catholicculture.org. And of course, uh, all the other podcasts that I produce uh, for Catholic Culture Some generous donors have gotten together and offered us a $105,000 challenge grant, a matching grant. So uh, if we make the $105,000 in donations from you, uh, they will double it. But if we don't, they won't. So uh, we are not even halfway through that, and we really need to reach uh, the $50,000 mark this Thanksgiving weekend in order to be on track for success in uh, making this campaign. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do consider giving whatever you can. The easiest way is to become a sustaining member uh, for as little as $5 per month. And to do that, you can go to catholicculture.org slash donate. And if you'd like to uh, earmark the donation specifically towards podcast production, you can go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio Every little bit counts. We really appreciate your help, and we pray for our donors every day. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And if you're curious what's coming up next on the Catholic Culture Podcast, uh, you can definitely expect in the upcoming weeks uh, an interview with uh, Catholic jazz pianist and historian Deanna Witkowski about the great Catholic jazz pianist Mary Lou Williams, a very significant figure in jazz and a Catholic convert in her middle age. And also an interview, hopefully, with the editor of the new Tolkien uh, volume, The Nature of Middle-Earth, Carl Hostetter. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanksgiving, everyone.